we've already brought you a sensational set of fan theories that could change how you view your favorite movies. And now we're back for the sequel. Due to popular demand, we've brought you five more crazy but kind of plausible movie theories. This time, they're picked by you, straight from the YouTube comments of our last film theories video. The Shining is Kubrick's apology for staging the lunar landing. Break out the tinfoil hats for this one. In 1969, the United States sent some guys to the moon. It was a pretty big deal, and it was broadcast on TV live around the world. The whole thing was a feat of technology and science, the likes of which the world had never seen. Or was it? A certain group of people believed that it never happened, and that director Stanley Kubrick staged the whole thing using cinema magic. All of this hinges upon The Shining, and young Danny Torrance's discovery of Room 237, supposedly the most evil and heavily haunted room in the Overlook Hotel. At one point, Danny is seen playing with his toys in a hallway with a unique carpet design, not seen anywhere else in the Overlook. According to this theory, this pattern reflects the shape of an aerial view of a NASA shuttle launch site. Danny then rises to his feet, symbolizing the Apollo 11 rocket on his sweater lifting off. He proceeds to room 237, which was originally room 217 in the original Stephen King novel. Why the change? During the time of the movie's filming, Earth was believed to be approximately 237,000 miles from the moon. This distance regularly fluctuates due to orbit and actually averages out to about 238,855 miles, but who cares? It's a 1980 horror movie. There's also a scene showing Danny and his mother watching a TV that is visibly not hooked into anything. Allegedly, this illustrates that what people watched on the television during Armstrong's famous leap was all fake. When Danny's father, Jack Torrance, investigates room 237 after Danny is spooked, he finds a beautiful naked woman and embraces her. To Jack's dismay, the woman transforms into a decaying older woman. Is Kubrick admitting he was happy to take a well-paying job to stage the lunar landing until he realized what a deceptive thing it really was? Or maybe people just need to get out more. There's an entire documentary dedicated to breaking down a lot of Kubrick's subliminal messages hidden throughout The Shining. The documentary's name? Room 237. Signs was about demons. Remember the whole alien invasion thing that made up most of the plot of Signs? Well, what if they weren't really aliens? What if they were demons? According to a theory first published on Reddit, it could be the case. First, the alien invasion results in hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to temples, churches, and other religious buildings for safety. Are these proper shelters? Or a safe place to hide with demons roaming around? Second, we barely see any alien technology except for a few lights in the sky. Third, if these aliens can travel through space, it stands to reason they'd be smart enough to realize that they were allergic to water especially on a planet whose surface is covered with it. The alien, we mean demon, at the end of the movie isn't hurt by H2O alone, but because the water is blessed. Throughout the movie, Mel Gibson's daughter would regularly get a full glass of water, sip it, put it down, and get a new glass. Half-full glasses litter the house. When Gibson speaks of the day she was born, he describes her birth as holy, even saying that everyone who saw her that day thought she was an angel. This divine description transfers to her blessing every half-filled cup left throughout the house, effectively leaving holy water all over the place. It's not like the rest of the world chased off an alien invasion with a bunch of super soakers. Mad Max is death. Redditor Elder Corsair posted an awesome breakdown of Mad Max Fury Road, which argues that each of the three major warlords in the movie represent one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. Warlord Immortan Joe is pestilence. His people are sick due to the nuclear fallout throughout the land. Joe rules the population by offering them small amounts of water, as if he has the key to healing them. The second horseman, War, would be another warlord, the Bullet Farmer. You know, the guy firing wildly into the dark when the tanker was stuck in the mud? The third horseman, Famine, would be the warlord known as the People Eater, since he's huge and represents the gluttony of the rich. These guys trade food, drink, and weaponry among one another in order to ensure their rule on this apocalyptic wasteland. And the fourth horseman, Death? That's Max. Think about it. Max brings death wherever he goes across the wasteland, and he's haunted by the deaths of everyone he wasn't able to save. In his first scene, he brings death to a lizard-like creature by eating it. Death was on Furiosa's side and her mission was ultimately a success. Remember when Max walks off into the darkness to take on the bullet farmer's heavily armed vehicle? He destroys the whole thing by himself off screen, kills all the men on board, and hauls away all their stuff. You don't even see what happens. You just assume that Max killed them all, like he always does. It proves Max slash death is a constant, inexorable force of nature. Jar Jar Binks is a Sith Lord. Of all the movie theories mentioned in response to our previous video, Darth Jar Jar was the most frequently requested by far. 
As crazy as it sounds, lots of people believe the bumbling Gungan we met on Naboo back in The Phantom Menace is actually the most powerful Sith Lord in the universe. Think about this. Young Anakin Skywalker was able to escape just about every event unscathed due to his natural aptitude for the Force. Jar Jar was also unharmed during the battle between the Gungans and the Trade Federation. Don't let his goofy demeanor trick you. Remember, Yoda was originally introduced as just a silly, swamp-dwelling creature on Dagobah before turning out to be an old Jedi Master. Jar Jar can also be seen using a wave motion that usually accompanies the Jedi mind trick during various parts of Episode 1 when speaking to important characters. He apparently uses this while persuading the entire Senate to grant full control and emergency power to Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. And it works! This action puts Palpatine in the perfect position to control everything and rise to power as Emperor. Even when Qui-Gon Jinn mentions using the Force to guide him underneath the waters of Naboo, Jar Jar scoffs at the concept. Don't forget, Palpatine and Jar Jar Binks are both from Naboo, and they could have met each other decades earlier. At Qui-Gon's funeral at the end of The Phantom Menace, Jar Jar is standing right beside Palpatine which starts a recurring theme of them being seen together. In the beginning of Episode 3, you can see Jar Jar and Palpatine walking close to one another. Binks also senses Anakin and Obi-Wan's arrival at the beginning of Episode 2. He approaches the elevator for no reason and doesn't attempt to open the door. He just waits a second or two, knowing that they are coming, but still acts surprised to see them once the door opens in order to maintain his cover. Maybe Jar Jar's almost too obvious clumsiness wasn't why he was banned from the underwater Gungan city, and why they treated him like a threat when he arrived. Maybe Supreme Leader Snoke is a front, and Jar Jar Binks still continues to pull the strings of the dark side. And now for one more longtime theory that was actually proven to be true. Deckard is a replicant. Ridley Scott's 1982 sci-fi neo-noir classic Blade Runner is all about androids. These androids, also known as replicants, look and think like humans and possess self-awareness. All that, and they're mainly used for dangerous grunt work on off-planet colonies. Some of them try to abandon their hazardous work and hide on Earth. These escapees are tracked by Blade Runners, a group of special police operatives who find and execute errant replicants. Blade Runner Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, is responsible for eliminating a group of rogue replicants. It's a quest that leaves him questioning his duties, as he struggles with the idea that many of these replicants just want to live. One replicant he meets during his investigation even believes she is actually human. The idea that Deckard himself is a replicant has been debated for years. Harrison Ford claims that he was playing a human character. According to BBC News, Ford mentioned that he and the director had talks about Deckard being a replicant, and they both agreed that he was a human during filming. But in subsequent interviews over the years, Ridley Scott has said otherwise. He's a replicant. Perhaps Scott lied to Ford to make his performance much more convincing. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch more videos like the one you just saw. And leave us a comment to let us know if there are any more fan theories you'd like to see explored.